The Jewish language known as Yiddish, which is to be distinguished from Hebrew, Hebrew is the official language of the nation of Israel, but the Jewish language known as Yiddish is a very colorful language. It's filled with all kinds of rich and expressive words and phrases. Eastern European Jews created Yiddish about a thousand years ago in an attempt to unite themselves as a people. The language itself is actually a combination of German and Hebrew, and although no country speaks Yiddish as its official native tongue, yet it is regularly spoken by religious Jews, both in Israel and in the United States. In fact, a number of words and phrases have actually made it into our English vocabulary. Here are some of the more well-known Yiddish expressions that you may be familiar with. There's that famous word chutzpah, which uh, it means more than courage, more than, more than nerve. It really means incredible gall. It means nerviness. You're a nervy person if you have chutzpah. And you do have to sort of spit when you say that. <laughs> then there's the word klutz. The word klutz literally means a block of wood, but nobody really refers to it like that. It has come to refer to someone who is clumsy. It is interchangeable with another great Yiddish word, a shlemiel. Then there's a word I, I love, uh, the word mensch. It means an honorable, moral, good person. If you are called a mensch, be assured it is a compliment. That's not the case, though, with the next word. The next word is nudnik. This is definitely not a compliment. You don't want to be called a nudnik. If you are called a nudnik, it means you're a pain in the neck. Someone who won't leave another person alone. A synonym for a nudnik would be a pest. Then there's that other great word, schlep. Schlep is a unique word. It can be used as a verb or as a noun. When used as a verb, it means to drag something along to carry something a long distance in sort of a, a slow and awkward manner. But the word can also be used as a noun, in which case if you are called a schlep, it means you're a drag, you're a downer, you're a bummer. Nobody really wants to be around you. You're not much fun to be around, so you don't want to be called that word schlep. And one, that, one word that I grew up with because... Um, my parents sent me to uh, a Jewish camp, and this word was used. It's the word schmooze. Schmooze means to make small talk. It means to chat. So at camp, every day after dinner would be the schmooze hour, as we were supposed to chit-chat and talk. Now, as I said, these are just a few of really a number of Yiddish words that have become part of our English vernacular. However, one expression in Yiddish that isn't heard very often because it's just so negative and it conveys the worst situation imaginable is the phrase veizmir, sometimes also called veizmir. It's translated into English as woe is me, or if you put the oveizmir or oveizmir, it's like oh, woe is me. Now, usually veizmir is said by Jewish people today when they want to express dismay or exasperation, and it could be anything from a minor inconvenience to a frustrating experience. However, in biblical times, long before the Yiddish language existed, when a Jewish person said, woe is me, he was pronouncing a divine curse upon himself because of his own, his own sinfulness, as in the case of the prophet Isaiah, as I read earlier from Isaiah chapter 6, who having been caught, having caught a glimpse of the holiness of God, he recognized in light of how holy God was, how sinful he was, and he cried out, woe is me, for I am undone. However, it was one thing for a Jewish person to say of himself, woe is me, because he recognized how sinful he was, but it was something far more serious when someone with divine authority said to a Jewish person, woe unto you, because in doing this, they were pronouncing God's judgment upon that individual. And that's exactly what our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, was doing when in his sermon on the mount, he declared four woes upon 
unbelievers. Here's what the Lord said is recorded in Luke chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Now, as you'll recall from our previous studies, and I know it's been quite a few weeks since we had previous studies in Luke's gospel, but as you'll recall, these four woes immediately follow four beatitudes or statements of blessings that Jesus pronounced upon believers. But not only do these four woes follow the four beatitudes, they actually are directly connected to them. They're, they're linked to them and that they form exact contrasting pairs. That's to say these four woes are partners with the four beatitudes in the sense that they are corresponding opposites of them because each of these woes is presented as a direct contrast to each beatitude. So, just as Jesus pronounced a blessing upon those who are poor, he now pronounces a woe upon those who are rich. Just as he pronounced a blessing upon those who are hungry, he now pronounces a woe upon those who are well fed. Just as he pronounced a blessing upon those who weep, he now pronounces a woe upon those who laugh. And just as he pronounced a blessing upon those who are hated, he now pronounces a woe upon those who are well spoken of. Now the reason that Jesus made these four woe judgment pronouncements in his sermon was to let his listening audience know and understand that he was dividing them into two distinct groups. One group, those who were blessed, was made up of those who believed in him. These were his followers, citizens of his kingdom. And they were characterized, Jesus said, as poor in spirit, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, mourning over their sin, persecuted and spoken evil of by the world. The other group, those who had woes pronounced against them, they are unbelievers, those outside of Christ's kingdom, and they are characterized as complete opposites of his followers, as those who are rich, well-fed, laughing, and highly regarded by the world. And folks, it is to this second distinct group, those who are the recipients of his woes, that Jesus is conveying to them that in contrast to his followers who are blessed, they are under God's curse and his judgment and condemnation. But note this, not because they are rich, not because they are well-fed, not because they laugh, not because they are popular with others, but rather they are under God's judgment because they have rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah, their Lord, their Savior, and as a result, their attitude, the way that they reflected this rejection is wrong. It demonstrates that they're unbelievers. In other words, in contrast to those who are blessed and saved, those who have transformed character so that they're now marked by seeing their spiritual poverty, longing for righteousness, mourning over their sin, being hated for their faith. Those who are not his followers are marked by just the opposite, exactly the opposite. See, what Jesus is doing, as I said, he is dividing mankind into two opposite groups, those who are his true followers and those who are not his followers, those who are saved, those who are unsaved. And just as he spoke of what character qualities his followers have, so now in these woe judgments, he speaks of what characterizes those who are not his followers. And the seriousness of these verses for us is that if you see yourself in these woe judgments, and I don't mean you dabble with this, I don't, I don't mean there's some of this with you, but if your life is characterized by this and nothing else, if these character qualities totally describe you, then it means that you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, regardless of your profession. It means that you are still under God's judgment and you still need to repent of your sin and turn to Christ 
to save you. So, are these verses relevant? Are these verses important? Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially in a day that we recognize the Reformation and the gospel of grace and the call of God on our lives to come to Christ for salvation. So these verses are very important for us to understand and to respond to. So with this as our background, we're now ready to look at these four woe judgments with the first of them being the judgment that Jesus pronounces upon, number one, those who are rich. Verse 24. But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Now, as you can see, you really don't need me to say this because you can see it clearly yourself. Jesus begins his woe judgments by addressing those who are rich. And immediately then, we are faced with a question of interpretation. The, inter the interpretive question is this. Who does Jesus have in mind when he speaks of the rich? Is he referring to those who are rich in a material sense? In other words, those who are wealthy? And if so, why? Well, interestingly, the Bible does not condemn being wealthy. You may think it does, but it does not. Certain forms of government may condemn those who are wealthy. The Bible does not. In fact, Scripture very clearly states that God is the one who is responsible for making someone wealthy. We read, for example, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 7, these words, The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low, he also exalts. King David prayed these words in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 12, Both riches and honor come from you. And you rule over all, and in your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. And we see this truth illustrated in the fact that the Lord made David's son Solomon a very, very, very wealthy man. As we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 12, wisdom, God speaking to Solomon, wisdom and knowledge have been granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth, and honor, such as none of the kings who were before you has possessed, nor those who will come after you. And listen, Solomon wasn't the only Bible character who was wealthy. Scripture mentions other godly men who were wealthy and, and rich in a material sense. People, men who had loads of possessions. For example, in the Old Testament, Job was a very wealthy man, as was Abraham. In the New Testament, Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man, as was Barnabas. So being materially wealthy is not a sin, and therefore it is never, ever condemned in Scripture, since God is the one who grants riches to individuals. However, though wealth is not condemned, the Bible does give some very serious warnings to those who are wealthy, urging them not to trust in their riches. So we read in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, the Apostle Paul telling Timothy to instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. And just before entering the land of Canaan, the Lord through Moses, warned the children of Israel not to forget him when in the future he would bless them with an abundance of wealth in their new land. And so we read these words in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 11 through 14. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied, and have built good houses, and lived in them, and when your, your herds, and your flocks multiply, and your silver and gold multiply, and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now, in light of all these verses that uh, speak about wealth, we have to conclude that in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was not, was not making a blanket statement that all who were rich in possessions were unbelievers 
and therefore we're under God's judgment. No, not at all. He couldn't possibly be denouncing all wealthy people as unbelievers, not only because this would contradict scripture, which is something that he would never and, and could never do, but also because some of his disciples, and this may surprise you, some of his disciples were people of means, and he never condemned them for being financially well off. Now we know this was the case because of what we read uh, just a few chapters later in Luke chapter eight, verses one through three. Soon afterwards, he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him. Those are the 12 apostles. They were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward. And Susanna, and many others, now note this, who were contributing to their support out of their private means. Now, here we read about some women who were financially supporting the ministry of Jesus and the apostles. Just as today, you and your family choose to support a ministry, a missionary, some type of work. That's what these women were doing. And apparently, they were financially well off to do this, and Jesus never condemned them. He took their money. So if Jesus wasn't pronouncing judgment upon those who had a lot of money and possessions, then who were the rich he had in mind when he pronounced judgment? Well, listen closely. We have to interpret, I said this is an interpretive decision. We have to interpret our Lord's words, not only in the overall biblical context, which is what we've just done, but also in their immediate context. And the immediate context in which he was speaking has to do as Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount makes clear with spiritual issues rather than physical, literal, material issues. So just as the Lord's blessing upon those who were poor was for those who were poor in spirit, meaning that they knew that they were spiritually destitute and had no righteousness to commend them to God. So now he is pronouncing judgment upon those who are just the opposite. Those who mistakenly think that they are spiritually rich, incorrectly assuming that they have all kinds of righteousness to commend them to God. Concerning the contrast between those who are truly poor in spirit and those who mistakenly view themselves as spiritually rich. One Bible scholar said this, he said, as the latter are those who recognize their sad condition is true, is true repentance, in true repentance, so the rich are those who imagine that they have all that they need and can do without the kingdom of God. It's pardon, sonship, promise of heaven. They hold their head high, speak boldly and proudly, and are well satisfied with themselves. Many trust in themselves and are self-sufficient, many in their education, science, wisdom, and many in the common things of earth. You see, folks, Jesus is condemning those who think, who just think that they are in good standing with God because they believe that they have an abundance of righteous deeds, good work, so that they view themselves as being rich in good deeds, rich enough to count on these deeds, getting them into heaven. Simply put, Jesus is condemning those who are not righteous, but self-righteous. Those who think of themselves as morally superior, better than other people, falsely supposing that they have enough good works to gain entrance into glory. And the classic example in scripture of such an individual is the self-righteous Pharisee who the Lord spoke of in his parable in Luke chapter 18. Starting with verse 9, we read this. Jesus said, he told this parable we read to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. He said, two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and another a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And you know that he had to just dismiss this man with his hand, a wave of his hand, like the riffraff, like this guy here. He continued, 
I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Now Jesus went on to say this man was not, and I repeat, not justified in God's sight, meaning he was still dead in his sins regardless of all the religious things that he had done. How self-deceived this man was to actually think that because he fasted two times a week and that he paid his tithes and that he carried out other religious observances that God was so pleased with him that he would just gladly let him into heaven because his righteous deeds were sufficient to gain entrance. That God owed him this, that he was good enough to get into heaven. Little did he realize that God in his perfect righteousness, his perfect holiness, he looked upon his so-called righteous deeds as filthy rags. That's what Isaiah calls it in his long book. The apostle Paul had another word for it, manure. That's what Paul spoke when he referred to his own personal righteousness in Philippians chapter 3. He said, it's, it's just dung. It's manure. That's how God saw this man's this self-righteous man, his righteousness, filthy rags and excrement. But this man had actually deceived himself into thinking that he was rich in righteousness and that, that God owed him a place in heaven. And all those who think like him, and many still do, they are deceived as well. Because not only do they fail to understand how utterly sinful and depraved they are. Not only do they fail to understand the holiness and the righteousness of God that requires, that demands his judgment, but they fail to see that salvation is only possible through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Long ago, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said these very solemn words concerning the man who would dare to think that he could escape God's judgment by his own righteousness apart from Jesus Christ. Lloyd-Jones said this. He said, if you can find liberation from your besetting sin without the power of the cross of Christ, carry on. If you can find peace and rest in your troubled conscience without believing in the death of the Son of God for you and for your sins, go ahead. If you can lie on your deathbed and think of facing a holy God without fear and without alarm, I really have nothing to say to you. But if ever you should feel lost and miserable and wretched, if ever you should feel that all your righteousness is but as filthy rags, if ever you are filled with terror and alarm as you think of God and his holy law, if ever you feel utterly helpless and hopeless, then turn back to him, the Christ of the cross with his arms outstretched, who still says, look unto me and be saved, all ye ends of the earth. So then what is to become of those who have deceived themselves into thinking that they are rich in righteousness, rich enough to buy themselves a place in heaven. Well, Jesus addressed this at the end of his pronouncement of woe to those who thought they were rich in righteousness. Notice the end of verse 24. <coughs> he said, for you are receiving your comfort in full. And what our, our Lord meant by this is that the only comfort you will ever know in this world is the sense of comfort that you have right now from thinking that you're righteous enough and religious enough to enter heaven. That's the only comfort you will ever know, but it is a false comfort. Because the moment you die, you will be shocked and horrified to find yourself in the torments of eternal hell. This is exactly what Jesus said happened to the, the rich man who died in the story he told in Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19. Some people believe it's a true story. Others believe it is a parable that Jesus made up to just illustrate a truth. But regardless of it, this is a heavy truth that we're going to read about. Now, there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. In a poor man named Lazarus, not to be confused with the friend of Jesus, also named Lazarus, 
who was laid at his gate covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life, you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he's being comforted here and you're in agony. And Jesus said that this rich man who lived a life of complete comfort on earth, he was in agony after he died. And the great tragedy is that this man, who I happen to think that this is a true story because no other parable or no parable has proper names in it, but this does, that this man will be in agony for the rest of eternity with no hope of ever being comforted again. Don't be foolish like this man. Don't be foolish by thinking that you don't need Christ to get to heaven. Don't be so foolish as to think that you're rich enough in righteous behavior and righteous deeds to earn your way into heaven. You aren't. You're not. So repent of your sin. And as Lloyd-Jones said, turn to the Christ of the cross whose arms are still outstretched to receive you and to save you, rescue you, deliver you from your sins. So having pronounced the first woe judgment upon those who are rich, Jesus moved on to pronounce a second woe judgment, which he conferred upon those who are well-fed. Verse 25, woe to you who are well-fed now, for you shall be hungry. Now, in light of having previously said that believers are marked by being hungry, Jesus now says that unbelievers are marked by just the opposite. They're marked by being well fed. So what does he mean by this? Well, once again, we have to remember that Jesus is speaking in spiritual terms, not physical, literal terms. Therefore, he's not condemning someone who's just enjoyed a good meal and is feeling quite full and satisfied. That's not what he's doing at all. Listen closely. If the hunger that a believer has is for righteousness, meaning that they long to live by God's righteous standards as revealed in his word, then what Jesus is telling us is that unbelievers do not hunger for righteousness. Why? Because they're satisfied with their lives right now. They have feasted upon the pleasures of this world, and so they feel quite full, quite full with all that life has to offer them. And they're content. They want nothing more out of life than to eat, drink, and be merry. And having that, they're basically happy. You see, the only thing that a person like this hungers for is their own happiness, which they think they can attain by such things as making lots of money, purchasing a nice house, growing a family, and other earthly enjoyments. They seldom, if ever, think about death and what comes after death because their entire focus is on this life and this world, and they are quite satisfied with all of their earthly attainments. And if you approach a person like this and you tell them the message of the gospel and that they are condemned sinners who need Christ as their savior, they're not interested. And they're not interested simply because they don't want to change. They don't see a need in their life to change. They don't want to repent of their sin. They're quite content with their lives being well fed with what this world has to offer them. And they don't want to think about what might happen to them after they die. They put that out of their mind. It was to people like this that Jesus was referring to when he said in John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. Why, he said, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Their love of the darkness, folks, it's the same thing as being well-fed. Because they're, they're not interested in making any changes 
in their lives. They don't want righteousness. They are completely satisfied with loving and walking in darkness. So what happens in the future to people like this when they die? Well, look again at verse 25, because we read these words of Jesus, for you shall be hungry. Directly addressing those who are well-fed and satisfied with what this world gives them, Jesus tells them that when they die, they'll be hungry. Meaning what? Meaning that they'll be eternally hungry. Hungry forever. Never able to satisfy their souls. Writing about the horrors that await those who are satisfied with this life. Bible commentator William Hendrickson wrote these very sobering words. He said, Having never shown any appreciation for the higher values of life, these gluttons, unless they are converted, face the never-ending future with a maddening ache, a maddening ache that they can never, that can never be relieved, a burning thirst that can never be quenched, a ravening hunger that can never be alleviated. May this never be your experience. May you never live to be satisfied for the things of this world. Because if you do, you will be eternally dissatisfied with a hunger and a thirst that will never, ever end. And so having pronounced two, two woe judgments, one upon those who consider themselves rich in righteous works, and one upon those who were well fed and satisfied with the pleasures of this world, Jesus now makes a third woe judgment, a pronouncement, this time upon those who laugh. He says at this, in the second part of verse 25, woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Now once again, I remind you it's important to understand that Jesus is not talking in literal terms. He's not condemning literal Laughter. The Lord was not a killjoy. He didn't object to people smiling or laughing or having a sense of humor. And no doubt, Jesus himself enjoyed laughing with the apostles and others, especially while sitting around the table eating and, and drinking with them. Listen, have you ever known a Jewish person who didn't enjoy a good laugh? I mean, most, most comedians these days are Jewish. You have to say, of course not. And if you do happen to know some unique Jewish person who doesn't enjoy a good laugh, then I say, he's a schlep. <laughs> That's right. He's a drag. Nobody wants to be around him. And frankly, no one wants to hang around with someone who's always serious, who never smiles, never laughs, but you read through the four gospel accounts, and Jesus always had people around him. They wanted to be around him. He must have had a great sense of humor. You see, the laughing that Jesus is condemning comes from a person who does the complete opposite of those who mourn and weep over their sin. That's to say, Jesus is pronouncing judgment upon the person whose general demeanor is to laugh as he cruises through life without any thought, without any regard concerning his or her sin. They're happy, they're content with life, they delight in silly merriment because they never give any consideration to the seriousness of their sinful condition before a thrice holy God. This is the kind of person who's happy with the way things are. The person who confidently assumes that heaven awaits them because they think they have nothing to fear when they die. Concerning people like this, one Bible teacher described them as smugly content with their religious achievements and superficial morality. They happily contemplate the eternal bliss that they foolishly imagine awaits them in the eternal kingdom. But once again, like the previous two kinds of people that Jesus has condemned, those who laugh now due to their false view of themselves will, unless they repent, and trust Christ, they will face a dreadful, a dreadful future when they die, as Jesus reveals in the last few words of verse 25. For you shall mourn and weep. The moment they die, their laughter will be turned into mourning and weeping that will last forever. And why 
Will they be mourning and weeping after they die? Well, it won't be because they regret their sin and wish they had repented before dying. And I say that because there is no repentance or longing to repent after death. There is no person in hell today who wants to repent. Why? Because the unregenerate sinful heart only gets harder and harder and harder as time goes by. No, the mourning and the weeping that Jesus is referring to is the agony, the torment of a lost soul in hell, especially someone who thought they were going to hell and had the shock of their lives, wake, or thought they were going rather to heaven, but had the shock of their lives waking up in hell. Jesus spoke of a group of people like this in Matthew chapter 8, first verse 11 and then verse 12. He said, I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now the people from the east and west that Jesus was referring to are those who lived east and west of Israel. In other words, he's referring to Gentiles, non-Jews. So what our Lord is saying that in his future millennial kingdom, his 1,000 year reign on the earth, there will be many believing Gentiles who will enjoy the blessings of salvation with the Jewish people and their patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then notice what Jesus said immediately following this in verse 12. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, the sons of the kingdom are none other than Jewish people who mistakenly think that they're going to be in God's kingdom simply because they are Jewish, because they are physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But instead of laughing and enjoying the eternal company of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom, Jesus said they will be cast into the outer darkness of hell where there, there will be weeping and groaning and they will experience agony for all of eternity. And that's why Jesus pronounced woe unto them. Because as I said earlier, they just cruise. They move through this life laughing, not taking their sin seriously, never really thinking about it. And because of that, they will forever be weeping because of their sin. I pray that those of you who don't seem at all concerned about your sin will get concerned so that you will think seriously about your need to repent and to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. How tragic it would be for you who know the gospel to not experience the everlasting joy that comes with the gospel. The joy that you have heard and the gospel you have heard preached at Lakeside many times and from this pulpit many times. But instead of experiencing the joy that you've heard preached, if you don't know Christ, you'll only experience everlasting agony. And there's, there is nothing more tragic than that, that you had opportunity and blew it. So close and blew it. And so having pronounced judgment upon the rich, the well-fed, and those who laugh, Jesus declared the fourth and final woe judgment upon those who are well spoken of. He said in verse 26, woe to you, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Now, as you'll recall, if you think back, the last beatitude that Jesus gave was upon those who were not well spoken of, but who were hated. He said in verse 22, looking back, Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. And so now... In pronouncing his final woe, the Lord pronounces it upon those who are the complete opposite. Instead of being hated, these people are esteemed. They're popular. They're well spoken of. And why would Jesus condemn such people? What's wrong with people liking you, saying good things about you? We, we all like that. We all would like people to say nice, positive things about us. And the answer is, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with that. And Jesus isn't condemning anyone simply because people have positive things to say about them. So then, why is he condemning them? Listen closely. 
Jesus is condemning those who others speak well of because of what they had to do to gain the approval of others. Namely, they had to become man pleasers by telling people what they wanted to hear rather than what they needed to hear, which is the truth. This is precisely why Jesus ended his pronouncement of such people by saying these words. For their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. In other words, in Old Testament times, the people of Israel, they loved their false prophets, and there were many of them. They loved them because they told them what they wanted to hear. They told them that God wasn't going to judge their nation. They told them that they were going to live in peace rather than be attacked by some foreign power. Peace, peace, they said. Listen to what we read about false prophets and how esteemed they were in ancient Israel. Jeremiah wrote this in Jeremiah 5, 30 and 31. An appalling and a horrible thing has happened in the land. He means the land of Israel. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule on their own authority and my people love it so. Jeremiah says that the people of Israel, they love the false prophets they loved hearing what they had to say because they told them what they wanted to hear, peace instead of war. And sadly, they hated true prophets like Jeremiah because he spoke the truth about their sinfulness and God's coming judgment due to their sin. And folks, that's the same way it is today. Nothing really has changed. The world speaks well of those who speak lies especially church leaders who are supposed to speak with some type of moral authority, but who never address sin. They never call people to repent. They never speak of such negative things as judgment and hell. The Apostle Paul spoke about this very thing in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Notice what he said to Timothy, starting with verse 1. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. That means always be ready. That's the only two seasons there are, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come. This is why you keep doing this, Timothy. Do it now. Because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance <coughs> to their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, you Timothy, you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now Paul commands... Timothy, to keep preaching the word of God and doing the work of an evangelist in proclaiming the gospel of salvation. Why? Because he says, there's coming a time, note this, when those who go to church will no longer listen to the truths of the word of God anymore. Instead, they will hire pastors who will feed them nothing but positive, feel-good messages by teaching them those things that fit and justify their sinful lifestyles. Turning away from the truth, they will only have ears to hear lies. Folks, it's obvious that the day Paul envisioned is here. It's arrived because churches today are filled with popular pastors who never preach about sin they never talk about God's holiness. They never mention judgment and eternal hell. They never tell their people they need to repent. And they certainly never lead their congregation in practicing church discipline. Just let sin go unchecked. Instead, they tickle the ears of their people by telling them the lies espoused by their culture. That evolution is a fact and that man is just another species of animals. It doesn't really matter what he does. What can you expect? He's just another animal. Treat him like an animal. That God is a God of love, only love, who never, ever would punish anybody. That murdering an unborn baby is a woman's right. 
that homosexuality is fine and has God's approval, and that you can decide what gender you want to be. And those who say and, and teach such things, they're well spoken of. Their books sell. They're esteemed. They're honored for being so enlightened and progressive, so in step with the culture of their day, but they're wrong. And they speak lies, and Jesus condemned them, and in doing so, he was saying that they are unbelievers because being a man pleaser is what characterizes an unbeliever. He tells people exactly what they want to hear, and they love him for it. How different we as Christians are to be. We who follow Jesus, who said of himself that he was the truth, and we who are indwelt by the spirit of truth, and we who believe the word of truth are those who are called to speak the truth regardless of the consequences. And the consequences of speaking the truth, as Jesus so clearly told us, in the beatitude is that you will be hated, and you'll be ostracized, you'll be insulted, and you'll be falsely accused. Certainly, you won't be well spoken of. My friends, if you're a Christian, then you must determine, and you must be resolute that you are going to pursue pleasing God by speaking the truth, rather than pleasing men and telling them what they want to hear. You have to speak the truth, even if that invites criticism and makes you unpopular with your family, with relatives, with friends, with peers. There have been a number of times in my life when I am very conscious that if I say something that I'm planning on saying, especially in a sermon, I know that it will very likely draw criticism and irritate some people, some who are even friends of mine. And when I find myself facing a situation like that, what I tend to do is to turn to the Apostle Paul's words in Galatians, Galatians chapter 1 for strength and for courage. Here's what Paul wrote in Galatians 1 verse 10. This would be a great verse to memorize and to meditate on. Paul said, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Now, Paul recognized that prior to becoming a Christian, he was a man pleaser. He, he was a self-righteous Pharisee who was trying to impress others by his religious behavior. But now, now, as a servant of Christ, he seeks only to please his master, Christ. That's exactly how every Christian is to live. As one who seeks to please the Lord, rather than men. So how do you do this? How, how practically do you do this? Well, if you go back to Galatians chapter 1, you'll see exactly how to do this because Paul proceeds on to tell us how he did this. Notice that immediately after he said that he was seeking to please God, he explained how he sought to please God. Galatians 1, 11 and 12 he said, for, and notice that's a connecting word, for, this is his word of explanation, for I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul is telling us that the way he sought to please God is by proclaiming, by speaking the gospel, the revealed word of God about Christ and from Christ. In other words, he, he's saying that the way you please God and not man is to speak biblical truth, is to speak principles based upon Scripture, not necessarily quoting verses to people, but speaking the truth, principles based upon Scripture, sanctified common sense, and not the fallible opinions of men. Otherwise, you'll find yourself compromising, always compromising in order to gain the approval of others. Listen, in order to please God, you must be willing to have some people think poorly of you. Here's the way that great theologian R.C. Sproul put it. He said, the only way to have a reputation where everybody speaks well of you is to wear two faces and to be a man pleaser, to make sure that you please everybody around you. If you're a man pleaser, you cannot please God. 
So if you're going to be a disciple of Christ, all men will not speak well of you. And in order to be a Christian, you must do as your Lord did. Make yourself of no reputation. So these are the four woe judgments that Jesus pronounced on unbelievers. The question is, the question is, do they describe you? Is your life totally characterized by thinking that you're rich in righteous deeds that'll get you to heaven? Are you satisfied, totally satisfied, by being well-fed with the things of this world? Do you love the things of this world? That's what you live for. That's what you feed upon. Do you only laugh as you go through life? You never mourn over your sin. You never think about your sin. Life is just one big happy time to you. And are you well-spoken of by others simply because you tell them what they want to hear? You, you play the game. You play the audience. If these qualities totally completely characterize you, then according to Jesus, you are simply not a believer in him, but rather you are under the judgment of God. And unless you repent of your sin, which means to turn from your sin, forsake your sin, and turn to Christ, and trust his substitutionary and sacrificial death on the cross for your salvation, you will end up in eternal hell when you die. How tragic. But the good news is that Christ loves you. He's holy. And he loves you. And he invites you to come to him and be saved from your sin. So what do you do with that? Well, you come to him today. You don't let another day go by. You're not promised another day. You come to him right now and you experience the blessings of salvation rather than the woes of eternal ruin. If the Lord is at work in your heart and you're convicted of your sin and you want Christ as your savior but you have questions you're not quite sure then just see me at the close of the service and I'll direct you to one of our pastors one of our elders and I'll ask our elders to come up after and they'll explain to you the way of salvation and they'll help you now if you're a believer then understand that while your life isn't it'll never be totally characterized by these traits it's very easy for us to dabble in some of this stuff, so that at times you can be self-righteous. At times you can be too satisfied with the things of this world. At times you can take your sin too lightly, and at times you can say things only to please others. If that's the case, it'll never totally, uh, never totally characterize you, but if it's the case where at times that's true in your life and you're aware of it, then you need to simply repent. Say, Lord, forgive me. And help me by your grace to not do that again. Help me. Just forgive me. And it is forgiven. You see, praise God that he has already delivered you as a believer from judgment. You'll never come into condemnation because of what Christ has done for you. He was condemned in your place. You'll never hear, woe unto you. You'll never hear those terms. You'll only hear how blessed you are. Blessed only because of all Jesus Christ has done for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words, uh, sobering words, strong words, how appropriate on Reformation Sunday to hear these truths which speak of heaven and hell, Lord. A truth that had been hidden so long in uh, Roman Catholicism, but has now been brought to light, Lord, and we proclaim it today, the gospel of Christ. Lord, I pray for any here who upon hearing these woe judgments see themselves in them and they're they're smitten in their hearts, I pray that they will come to you. I pray that they will run to your outstretched arms of mercy and be saved. I pray, Lord, for those of us who hear these things and realize that too often we're, we're like this. It may not fully characterize us, but too often we're like this. May we repent And by your grace, live lives that reflect your holiness and your true righteous standards, both both outwardly and from our hearts. All of this we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. I hope we'll see you tonight.